precision that enables us to hold a paintbrush, manipulate tools, pilot a jet fighter, record our thoughts, all those things that separate us from other apes. Of course, having a nimble hand is one thing, but you have to know how to use it. And for that, you need to have humankind's other signature organ, our brain. The human brain is vast, three times bigger than a chimp's, and is structured very differently. How this extraordinary organ evolved is central to understanding why we are the way we are. It is something that Darwin himself was at a loss to explain, which is why many of his critics remained unconvinced by his account of human origins. But now, part of the answer to why we have such a remarkable brain may have come from a surprising source. Hansel Stedman is a dedicated athlete and a medical doctor. He never imagined he would come up with an answer to a profound evolutionary mystery. He has devoted his career to trying to cure muscular dystrophy, a distressing and sometimes fatal degenerative disease. His quest is very personal. My first exposure to muscular dystrophy was inescapable. My younger and my older brother, both born with muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic disease. Its sufferers have a mutation in one gene that robs their muscles of the ability to repair themselves. Typical workout here on the rocks might blow through a few thousand muscle cells, but they'll regenerate overnight, and if anything, be a little stronger the next day I come in as a result of all of that. Whereas in muscular dystrophy, the injury process is greatly accelerated, and the injury process outstrips the body's ability to repair. In search of a cure, Stedman is investigating the hundreds of genes that control the development of muscles. So when the Human Genome Project took off, Stedman seized his chance. When the horsepower of the entire Human Genome Project kicked in, we knew exactly what to look for. Stedman was hunting for any new muscle-making genes. And so, as the human genome was sequenced, he began sifting through the vast mountains of data. Eventually, he found what he was looking for, a previously unidentified muscle-making gene. But there was something strange about this new gene. It didn't look like any other muscle-making genes. Two letters were missing. This gene should cause a disease. It became very clear early on that if you have a mutation of this type, you get some serious muscle problem going on. Here was a puzzle. Why would humans carry a gene that was clearly damaged? Perhaps it was simply a mistake in the data. Stedman decided to dig a little deeper and look in another human subject. In the Department of True Confessions, we do certain experiments first on ourselves, largely out of convenience. You know, you can, you can swab your own cheek and get working on some DNA. To his utter amazement, he found the same damaged gene in himself. I'm seeing this in my own DNA, and it's suggesting, now, wait a minute, that means there's a muscle disease here somewhere, a muscle disease that I'm unaware of, and I thought it would be worth uh, checking this out in some other members of the lab. A few swabs later, and... Sure enough, at the end of the day, every single person had the same glitch and their same DNA at the same place.
Here, then, was a real mystery. It seemed that this particular muscle-making gene was common in humans. But when he identified the same gene in apes, it was just like any other muscle-making gene. Why was there such a difference? What did this gene enable one species to do that the other could not? Stedman began to research the role of this gene in apes, and he found it made one particular kind of muscle. The muscle for chewing. In fact, the muscle used to close the jaw. In humans, that genetic glitch meant that we chew with just a fraction of the force of an ape. This in itself was interesting, but where Stedman went next was truly intriguing and highly controversial. He drew a direct connection between the power of our jaw muscle and the evolution of the human brain. Stedman's thinking goes like this. The skulls of apes and humans are made of several independent bone plates. They let our heads get bigger as we grow. The muscles for chewing pull against these plates. And in an ape, these forces can be enormous. In the gorilla, the muscle, the size of a human thigh muscle, lives here and has to go through this large space to power the jaw moving back and forth. We're not talking biceps, triceps, we're talking quad here. This is an enormous muscle that has to come right through this hole here to power the jaw closing apparatus. Stedman contends that all this muscle power forces an ape's skull plates to fuse together at an early stage. And this puts limits on how much the brain can grow. In a chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, those growth plates are pretty much shut down, closed for business by about three, four years of age. In a human, they remain open for growth to perhaps age 30. This, Stedman believes, is the key. A mutation in our jaw muscle allows the human skull to keep expanding into adulthood, creating a bigger space for our brain. And so our most important organ is able to grow. It's very cool to us to think that some kind of muscle-altering mutation might have actually been a signature event in the uh, evolution of what makes us distinct as a species. It might have been an absolute prerequisite for us landing where we are today. But having the space for a big brain is one thing. What is needed to actually grow one? Uh, and again, a very small cerebral cortex with very few That is the question that Chris Walsh is trying to answer. He's another scientist who never expected to be taking on what even Darwin didn't know. I never thought that I'd be studying evolution. I'm a neurologist interested in the brain and uh, in kids with neurological problems. How you doing, buddy? You doing all right? Huh? Doing okay? No one was more surprised than us to find that the study of kids with disabilities would lead us into these fascinating evolutionary questions. Is breathing generally okay during the day? Sometimes when he gets startled, it'll, it'll go up fast, oh. like, but then he calms himself right back down and it comes back. Walsh is a specialist in a rare disorder called microcephaly. Children with microcephaly are born with brains that can be half the normal size. This disorder 
can be very devastating for the kids that have it. They typically will have severe mental retardation and so will not be able to achieve normal language and normal schooling. And so it's really an event that defines the whole family. It defines the lives, not only of the child, but of the parents of that child. And uh, these families are desperately uh, eager to try to understand at least what caused the disorder in their kids. And the range would be between these two. The purpose of Walsh's work was initially to help families that might be carrying any defective genes causing microcephaly to plan their lives. We're able to offer those families predictive testing so that if they're planning on having additional children, we can tell them ahead of time whether that child is likely to be affected or not. First, Walsh had to decide where to look in the vast genome to find any possible microcephaly-causing genes. So he focused on one particular area of DNA. Other research suggested it contained a gene involved in the condition. That gene is known to control how and when brain cells divide in animals, such as fruit flies and mice. What this gene seems to do is help control the fundamental decision that the brain has to make, which is, when do I stop making cells? When is the brain big enough? Then his team began searching for that same gene in a family with a history of the disease. And sure enough, they found something. A gene that helps direct brain growth. And crucially, it was defective. Walsh decided to check this finding in other patients. Once we found this gene, we sequenced it in our kids uh, with the microcephaly disorder, and we found that one family after another had a disabling change in the gene that completely removed its function. In total, he has found some 21 different mutations responsible for microcephaly. Sometimes one of the DNA's chemical letters is replaced with another letter. Sometimes letters are missing entirely. But whatever the defect is, they all stop the brain cells from dividing at a very early stage of development. Walsh was now certain, thanks to his microcephaly patients, he had found a gene key to the growth of the human brain. Now he decided to compare normal versions of the gene found in healthy humans with the same gene in chimpanzees, our closest relatives. And what he found was astonishing. The gene in humans was radically different from that found in chimps. There had been a large series of mutations It could be that these mutations were a major factor in the evolution of our huge brains. And this discovery came about only because of Walsh's work with his patients. I think one of the uh, amazing things for us was the extent to which studying human disease can unexpectedly enlighten us about something like human evolution. But this is only the beginning of our understanding of the evolution of the human brain. It's an area of research that is now attracting scientists with a range of skills that Darwin would have marveled at. Katie Pollard is a biostatistician. Her life is spent crunching numbers. What I love about my work is geeking out on a computer and writing programs and thinking about biology. And that in doing this, I'm actually working on something that not just scientists care about, but really every human being can relate to and cares profoundly about. And that's what makes us human. Pollard has constructed an ambitious computer program. It's designed to highlight DNA that is similar in apes and other animals but which is very different in humans. That way, she hopes to identify the key DNA that makes us, us. 